And today we're talking more about that community and what it means. We're continuing to go through Acts. We're in Acts 3. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about opportunities. But before we talk about opportunities, we're going to talk about potty training. Because, well, look, look, that's kind of where I'm at in my life right now, okay? <laughs> so you get stuck hearing about what's going on in my life because this is where we're at. So we just potty trained our third um, child. And potty training is always a, a blessing and a curse, right? So it's great because you want to get them out of diapers. It's a struggle because to get them out of diapers is actually a lot of work. And there's times when, and this just happened because we just got number three out of, out of diapers, and um, there was one instance in particular where I'm, I'm sitting at my dining room table and I, I'm working and uh, he has to go potty, okay? Well, he can't get up on the potty and everything without help, so he needs someone to help him. And I'm right in the middle of something, but Jessica is also in the middle of something because she's changing a diaper. All right, changing a diaper trumps what I'm doing, I guess. Um, <laughs> so my immediate, my instant response was, buddy, I'll be, I'll be right there, I'll be right there. And then I had to stop myself and say, no. No, nothing is more important in this moment than my son and the goal that we are trying to achieve. So in that moment of, of interruption to what I was doing, there was actually also an opportunity. And the opportunity was help him, helping him to take that next step in his growth, which is getting out of diapers and becoming that big boy, right? As we said all the time with him. And the other opportunity was showing my son that nothing is more important than him. And in those moments, allowing that to not be an interruption, but an opportunity, and that's what we're going to talk about today because as a church, if we are the family of God and we are, we are doing God's mission and living God's mission, then we have to be ready for those divine interruptions that God is going to bring and say, what is the opportunity here? What am I going to do with this interruption? So if you'd open with me to Acts chapter 3. We're going to read verses 1 through 10, and almost always I read out of my NIV Bible. Today I'm reading out of my NASB Bible, so if you're looking at your, your Bible in the pew, it's, it's going to be a little bit different. Uh, some of the words will be a little different, uh, but I promise you it's the same, same passage. So Acts 3, 1 through 10. Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the ninth hour, the hour of prayer, and a man who had been lame from his mother's womb was being carried along, whom they used to set down every day at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, in order to beg alms of those who were entering the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to go into the temple, he began asking to receive alms. But Peter, along with John, fixed his gaze on him and said, Look at us. And he began to give them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I do not possess silver and gold, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. And seizing him by the right hand, Peter raised him up, and immediately his feet and his ankles were strengthened. With a leap, he stood upright and began to walk, and he entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God, and they were taking note of him as being the one who used to sit at the beautiful gate of the temple to beg alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you have revealed yourself to us. 
And Lord, I pray that you would pour your spirit out on this place today, that you would give us ears to hear and hearts to receive the message that you have for us. And whether that message is something that I speak, that you speak through me, or something that you just speak as, uh, the, as people are looking at your word or through the worship or, or the, the songs, whatever it is, Father, speak to us wherever we're at today that we may look more and more like your son, Jesus, and speak to us as a whole that our church may look more and more like the Church of Acts. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So in our passage today, we recognize that there are oftentimes opportunities and interruptions if we are looking for them. You see, Peter and John, they were on their way to somewhere important, right? They weren't just kind of wandering down the street on a lazy day. They were actually, they were heading somewhere. They were heading to their prayer time, their prayer meeting. And all of a sudden, as they're heading to this prayer time at the temple, this 3 p.m. prayer time, somebody calls out to them asking for help. Now, now how often you've been on your way somewhere where, especially if you're running behind or something and, and somebody calls out to help or maybe God just gives you a nudge and says, hey, I want you to do this. I don't know how good you are at saying, okay. I will stop what I'm doing, I'll, I'll put this on hold, and I'll do what you're calling me to do. So I don't know, in this situation, how would you have responded? How would I have responded in this situation? You see, too often, I still want to walk right by. Because what could be more important than prayer, right? Right? What could be more important than getting to church or to where God wants me, where I think God wants me to be or where I want to be? How could this guy asking for money be more important than me getting to where God, I think God wants me to be? But in this case, this happened to be a divine interruption. Now, not all interruptions are divine, right? There's divine interruptions, and then there's just common distractions. Now, common distractions, and when we don't have boundaries, people are always asking for something, and some of us without boundaries will be like, I must say yes, I have to say yes to every little thing, and that's not healthy either. We can't say yes to everything. So sometimes these, these distractions, these interruptions or divine interruptions, sometimes they're just common distractions but how do we understand, how do we know what kind of interruption this is? How can we discern between the two? Now, I think I'm getting better at discerning between these a little bit. More and more, I, I hear God say to me or, or point me in a direction and saying, you know, go do this, go talk to this person, or if somebody asks for something, saying, okay, stop in this moment and, and do this. I'm getting better at hearing those things. I'm not always great at doing those things. I'm, the other day, we were at Arby's, and uh, we had just stopped. We had the whole family there, and it was about two weeks ago, and a person comes in and looked like they were homeless, um, gets a drink, gets a, a sandwich, and he sits down in the corner, and all of a sudden, I just sense God saying, go and talk to him. And... Then the two bigs had to use the bathroom, so Jessica's up in the bathroom with them. Now I got the littles. And then after that, they come back out, and we're starting to get packed up, and I still hear God saying, go talk to this person, go talk to this person. Sadly, I did not listen to that nudging. I didn't take advantage of that opportunity, and I know that God was calling me to it. And I share this story with you guys because I don't want you to be discouraged when you hear God nudge you or sense God nudge you and, and maybe you don't move right away, keep working at it. Because more and more I'm getting to the place where normally now I do go and have those conversations. I do stop for those interruptions. So I'm better today than I once was. And one of the reasons that I think I'm doing better in this today than I used to is because I have been working 
hard with our spiritual formation group here and, and just on my own to draw near to God. Right? And we talk about how do we draw near to God. We talk about this over and over and over again in these sermons. We draw near to God through what Richard Foster calls the spiritual disciplines. We call near, draw near to God through what John Wesley called those means of grace. In our spiritual formation group on Monday mornings at 10 o'clock, we spend the first 15 minutes talking about one of those disciplines. And then we spend about the next 45 minutes in silence or, or prayer as God leads us to pray. Ultimately, learning to listen for God, learning to sense God's presence. And the closer that I get to God, the more I sense his presence and the more I hear his voice during those times. And I believe that Peter and John recognize that this interruption was not just a common distraction because of that relationship they have with the Father. And it's not that they have this relationship just because they, are, they were disciples of Jesus and now apostles. They have this relationship with the Father because they are continuing to practice those disciplines. They were on, the way, on their way to that 3, a, 3 p.m. prayer meeting. And this wasn't just random. You see, this was an everyday occurrence. The Jewish people at 9 a.m., at noon, and at 3 p.m., they prayed. You stopped during those prayer times. They, they get this from Psalm 55 when David says, As for me, I call to God, and the Lord saves me. Evening, morning, and noon, I cry out in distress, and he hears my voice. So probably three times a day, they are heading to the temple for prayer. And prayer is just one aspect of their rule of life. Now maybe you've never heard that term, rule of life. This is something we're also working on right now with our spiritual formation group and also our staff and our leadership team just listened to a podcast about having a rule of life. You see, truth is, we all have a rule of life. In my rule of life, this is what my routine is, and that's kind of our routine. What are the things we do every day? What are the things we do every week? What are the things we do every month? In my rule of life, my routine, I wake up in the morning, 6.30, my alarm goes off, I hit the snooze, go back to sleep. The alarm goes off again. Eventually, I get up, usually not because of the alarm, but usually because Eli is in our room telling us he has to go to the bathroom, then asking if he can play with his Legos, and um, eventually he's like, fine, let's just get up. I get up, I go downstairs, and I make the juice for the kids, get their juice ready, go back, ask them what they want for breakfast. Normally, Amelia says she wants two waffles. Eli says if it's nice out, like right now, a frosted mini wheats. If it's cold, then it's peach oatmeal. And Eli is, or Josiah's the wild card. You never know what he's having for breakfast, so I gotta find out what he's having. Finish making breakfast, I make my own, my, my protein shake and do my thing, then go up, get in the shower, get dressed, come down, get the kids, take them to school, and then I come to work. You see, that is my rule of life. That is the stuff that I do as a routine every single day. What I'm trying to incorporate into my rule of life now is God. As sad as that sounds, I have to incorporate God into my rule of life. See, I pray every day, but not planned, not orderly, where this is the time where I'm gonna stop and spend time with him. So I've tried to incorporate that into about 8.50, because I, once I get here to the church at 8.30, I spend a little bit of time with Steve Muscarella. We talk about the church, life, whatever and then trying to spend five, 10 minutes just in prayer before our day starts here, usually at nine and the staff comes in. You see, I'm trying to incorporate God into my rule of life so that it's an every day or every week or every month practice. So incorporating the prayer, incorporating scripture, incorporating fasting into these rules of life. Uh, some others are solitude, contemplation, service, simplicity, confession, worship. All of these things draw us closer 
to God. They bring us into a closer communion with God. So go back to that question we asked. How do we know how to discern if it is a divine interruption or a common distraction? When we get closer to God, we will know. I know what God wanted me to do at Arby's that day. There's no doubting it. I just didn't do it. As we get closer to God, we will hear his voice, sense his presence, feel those nudges. And I can show through this passage here, we can see that this is exactly what happened with Peter and John. Their mission to attend that 3, 8, 3 p.m. prayer was interrupted about by this man calling out, asking them for money. So what does the passage say that Peter and John did? Now, in your, if you read it with me, the NIV said that Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Now, the NASB said that Peter and John fixed their eyes on him. This is why I wanted to read this passage in the NASB. To fix your eyes on somebody seems to me more powerful than they just looked at him. And the word here for look straight at him, the word here for what is translated as fix their eyes or looked at is atenizo. It's the same phrase that's going to be used in Acts 14, 9 and 10. When there's another lame man there calling out and or listening to Paul give a sermon, actually. And when Paul is given the sermon, during that time, Paul fixes his gaze on this man and had seen that he had the faith to be made well. So he said with a loud voice, stand upright on your feet, and the man leaped up and began to walk. Paul fixed his gaze on this man, and he didn't see the man He saw something within the man. You see that that, uh, word, atenizo? It means to look intently at or look into. When Paul looked at that man asking for help, or looked at that man listening to his message, Paul looked into him and saw, not with his own eyes, but with God's eyes, When Peter and John are talking to this lame man at the gate, they weren't looking with their own eyes. They were looking intently into him, and they saw this man with God's eyes, and they knew what they were supposed to do. As you draw near to God, I do believe that you will be able to discern between what is a divine interruption And what is a common distraction? And then we just need to be faithful to what God calls us to do in that moment. And if you are getting deeper and deeper in your relationship with God, you not only will recognize the difference between the distractions and interruptions, you will also recognize what the real need is. You see, what was this man's need? He needed money, right? I mean, he was just looking for a little bit of money to survive another day. But Peter and John, filled with the Spirit, understood that this man's need wasn't just for another meal. It wasn't just to get a buck to pay the rent. This man's real need was Jesus. Now, I'm sure that Peter and John that morning were not expecting to work this type of miracle as they were walking, or that afternoon, as they were walking to prayer. And this man was not expecting to receive a miracle. His only hope was to get a little bit of money to live on. The last thing that this man expected that day was that he was going to be made whole. But that is exactly what this divine interruption led to. You see, we are so quick sometimes to toss money at something or someone, to pass out something to people, to give stuff, or even to invest time. 
And I'm not saying that any of those things are bad, right? I used to love serving at the, the food pantry in Westfield. It was one of my favorite times of the week. But the need is so much greater than just the physical. What good is it if we fill people's bellies, but we leave their souls empty? What good is it if we add a few years to their life, but ignore their eternity? The needs are so much greater than what we generally try to do. And we always must keep that deeper need at the forefront of whatever we are doing. Ask yourself right now, where is the Spirit leading you? How can you incorporate the good news of Jesus into the areas where you are serving? Whether in your ministries, whether in your workplace, in your friends groups, hobbies, whatever it is, where is God calling you to go deeper? You see, Peter understood this, so Peter shared the good news of Jesus with this man when he proclaimed, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. And the NASB, like I said, says this, then Peter seized him by the right hand. He raised him up, and immediately the man's feet and ankles were strengthened. The healing had occurred. God had shown up just as the Spirit had told Peter and John that he would. And when the man experiences this healing, what does he do? The man doesn't just get up and walk away. The man leaps up. This man who had never walked before, who had been lame from the time of his birth, who had to be carried to that place on the ground, leaped up and praised God. That word for leaped in the passage is such a, a cool word. He, uh, it's the same word that's used in Acts 14 that we just read where Paul performed the, a similar miracle and that man also leaped up and that word is halomai, which means to gush up. There's a connotation to water just gushing up and coming up. And the exciting part of that word, halomai, is that it's also used in John 4:14, 4, where Jesus says, and in our prayer time, we just talked about the woman in the well, the woman at the well. But it's the same word that Jesus uses in John 4, where he says, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst but the water that I will give him will become a well of water springing up, halomai, springing up to eternal life. When this man leaps up, it's not just because his legs have been healed and he's excited that he can use them, but his soul has been healed and now he has that eternal water gushing up within him that Jesus had promised that woman at the well. And when he leaps up and he praises God, everyone sees him doing it. He goes into the temple praising God with Peter and John. And the people are murmuring and they say, who who is this? Isn't this the man that sits there begging at the gate called Beautiful every day? Imagine the impact that that had on that city. And actually, we don't really need to imagine it because... Later on in Acts chapter 4, it's going to tell us that the impact was over 2,000 more people came to know Christ through this man, through this miracle that the Spirit performed through Peter and John. God showed up and his power was clear. And God is still showing up today. I am so excited with what God is doing in this church. And I just told you a minute ago, it's not the numbers that we're worried about. We're not looking to grow the congregation as much as we are learning to, or seeking to grow the congregants. 
It's not really success if you fill a thousand people into a building, but none of them really have a relationship with Jesus Christ. We want to grow the congregants of our church. And over and over and over, we have been seeing God speak to people in our church, calling them into new ministries. And God is showing up. And actually, Casey Gernot is going to join us up here, if you want to come up now. Um, And she's going to share what God has been doing in her life right now with a ministry that he has called her to. And she's really excited, not nervous at all. So we're going to pray for a minute for Casey before we sit down. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for Casey. I thank you for all you've been doing in and through her and her family. Lord, I pray now that you give her a calm spirit. Help her to sense your presence. Just give her the words to say and give her that peace, knowing that she is doing what you are calling her to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Yeah, have a seat. So we're going to, we thought it would be easier to do this kind of like an interview style thing here. So Casey, as uh, we start, why don't you first tell us a little bit about the ministry that God has called you to. Okay. Um, <laughs> well, um, all of a sudden it was kind of every place I look, you know when you get a new car and like then you see that car everywhere? Mm-hmm. All of a sudden in my life, all I saw was people that were in need or the unhoused in Jamestown and stuff. And I kept being pulled to that. And um, then I kind of found this, um, it's called Be the Change You Want to Be in Jamestown, a little Facebook group. And I started kind of reading what they were doing. I'm like, oh, wow, you know, that's amazing. And the next thing I knew, I was, you know, fairly involved in that. Okay. And what do you do with uh, what are you doing in Jamestown? Okay, like so um, every couple of Fridays we pull like wagons, like that you like put your kids in or like on the beach or whatever, filled with fresh fruits and um, personal hygiene products, socks, um, toilet paper, things like that. And we start out at that park that's across from the Post Journal, and we walk about three miles and end up at like the MHA. And we just give all of our supplies to all of the unhoused and and the people who are in need um, that we see as we're walking. At this point, they have a really good routine and they kind of know that we're coming. And we have a lot of regulars that, so we know that so-and-so always needs whatever and we kind of make sure that they always get that. Um, So, yeah, we just kind of are on our way doing that. Nice. And so this here, tying in with our message today, Mm because we're talking about interruptions, right? And uh, divine interruptions. (laughs) Explain how this was an interruption in your life. Um, Huge interruption. I honestly (laughs) didn't want it. I prayed for a couple of weeks that God closed this door and opened up something else. I asked Tom (laughs) to pray that the door was closed. Um, I absolutely wanted nothing to do with it. Um, And... I want, I was really being called to, I knew that they were pulling the wagons on this one Friday and I made no arrangements for a babysitter because I'm like, yeah, I mean, I'm definitely not going to do that. I, the river walk is dangerous. Like the Brooklyn Square is terrifying. Like I'm not going to go walk around down there. It's, and uh, so I woke up and was like, you know what, I'm going to text my mom because she's she, maybe she'll babysit, but there's no way. She's like a late sleeper. She's definitely going to say no, whatever. And she texted me back instantly at like, whatever, 7 o'clock. I was like, oh, yeah, I'll be right over. I'm like, <laughs> okay. So I guess that I have to go do this now. And um, showed up, and I don't know how I could ever go back and not do that anymore. Um, being able to, like you were saying, like looking them in the eye and being able to pray with them and tell them that not only are they worthy of love, but they mm-hmm. are loved. And um, praying out loud is not something that comes easy for me. And, um, but being able to pray with and hold hands with the people who nobody else even wants to look at um, and end it with a hug is so amazing. So it's, yeah, it's been life-changing. Yeah. 
Nice. And you talked about talking about the recognizing the real needs, mm -hmm. right? You talked about some of the needs that you go out and try to take care of. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned prayer a little bit. What else yep. are for needs are you trying um, to take care of? So I think that first and foremost, it's always God. And if God's not in the middle of everything that we're doing, it's not going to work. Mm -hmm. um, not that what we're doing is not almost like a Band-Aid on the, a lot of this situation that's going on, but um, that prayer and stuff goes into everything. But we're always, it's so funny, because even like you were saying that no one ever asks us for money, ever. Mm -hmm. It's toilet paper because they're homeless, they, and, or fresh fruit. They're always loving bananas and apples and oranges because it's not something that they typically get. Um, those little food pantries like kind of are popping up all over, which is wonderful, but a lot of the time it's like something canned or it's macaroni and cheese, but they can't cook it. Um, so things like that, or they go through a lot of the Vienna sausages or SpaghettiOs, anything that they can pop right open and, and eat. Um, socks is always huge. They always, everybody always asks for socks and nail clippers, like things that um, they, can't, they can't just start, get, they're not readily available. Yeah. And this week you took some new things out. We took some Bibles mm -hmm. out, right? Yep. Um, we, like I said, it's, we're just a bunch of volunteers who get mm -hmm. donations from whomever has extra. Um, I know me personally, we've just kind of like decided to tithe a little bit differently. So a little bit of the money that we were giving here, we mm -hmm. now, I make sure that we can get fruit, fruits and stuff. Um, but yeah, we were able to give out Bibles that you guys donated, which was amazing. And um, lots of, um, this week we gave out a ton of socks. I don't know, probably a couple hundred socks on Friday, um, which is always amazing. So, but being able to hand somebody the word who probably wasn't going to, you know, turn that way is, the, it's amazing, yeah. Yeah, which brings us to uh, another question. And where have you seen the power of God through this ministry? Oh, this is my favorite story. <laughs> um, that very first Friday, no, that's not true. The very first Friday I went out, we only, we call it pulling wagons, where I was saying that we pull the wagons and we distribute all of the supplies. Um, the next Friday, we went and found encampments. So not just the people living under the bridge, but the people who have almost made like permanent shelters hidden in different places, um, whether it's with a tarp or a tent or a random, random things that they found around. Well, we were able to find this young man named Nathan, and um, he has been so heavy on my heart ever since I met him. He, it was fairly cold that day, and he had just like a tarp, almost made like a lean-to out of it, and had a very thin blanket, the shorts and t-shirt that he had on, and a pair of shoes that I don't even necessarily think I would call shoes at that point. And that was it. And when we walked up to him, he was very like, you know, kind of like, oh my gosh, what are you guys doing here? Or whatever, like, you know, don't mess with me type. And we're like, nope, you know, like, do you need supplies? What can we help you with? And um, he, he needed everything. I'm, so we, he walked back to the cars with us, and Maverick, my son, actually had left a fishing pole in the car, and he could, knew how to fish, and he sort of buy some water, so he took that so that at least, you know, he can catch a fish to cook, or um, we gave him some clothes, and he was able to get warmed up, and personal hygiene products, and all of that, and we had asked if he was a believer, if he would, if we could pray with him, not just for him, but actually with him, and, um, we all locked hands and, and stood together and l just prayed that he would let Jesus into his heart and that he knew how loved that he was and that he was worthy of it. It makes me want to cry. He just sobbed, and you could just tell that he was so moved by all of that, and he was, like, d struggling with addictions and things, and he was like, this is, this is it. I know I know I can do this. I just, I'm, I'm going to stop. I'm going to do, you know, he's like this young 20-year-old little boy, he, you know, he needs a mom. So I'm like, I mean, if that's what I have to do is step up to like, you know, come and check on you and be your, be like, that's fine. And um, we ran into him the following Friday, we found him and he was clean mm -hmm. and he was well put together and he's found Jesus and he's so in love with Jesus. And mm -hmm. he, 
is trying his best to get to meetings and do all the things, and he's really, you know, turning it around. So ending it, even, and I guess backtrack a second, when we got done hugging, or got done praying, they all call me crazy because I, I ask every single one if I can give them a hug, if they would like a hug. And before I would have turned, like not only just turned the other cheek, but I would have never made eye contact. These people are scary. <laughs> and um, gave him a hug, and he just kind of like melted and was like, I can't tell you the last time that somebody gave me a soft, warm touch, like, I, I, you know, like, no, mm -hmm. nobody's, nobody's doing that. So mm -hmm. it's, that's, he's, he's such an inspiration. Mm -hmm. um, it makes me know that I can't stop now because if he can do it, anybody can, so. Mm -hmm. Amen, yeah. amen. Um, yes, <laughs> praise God. <laughs> um, just thank you for this ministry and for what you were doing. It's, not, it's Yeah, it's not me. It's all God. We <laughs> see, like, the loaves and the fishes every mm -hmm. Friday. We never have enough. Never. We're always like, oh, my gosh, we're going to run out. We're going to run out. And then we get to the very end, and there's one apple and one orange and one pair of socks left or whatever. And we're like, I don't know. We did 99 people, and we did not have stuff for 99 people. Yeah. So yes. it's amazing. Yeah, and that was yesterday, yep. right? Friday. No, Friday. Day before, Friday. Friday. 99 yeah. people yep. that they reached. How? Yep. Guys, um, let's stop and let's pray over KC in this ministry. And it's uh, Be the Change. Yep, Be the, the name Change of the in. Be the change in Jamestown in that you Jamestown. want to see. Or, okay. yeah. be the, we'll say be the change yep. in Jamestown. Let's yep. do that. <laughs> <laughs> Would you hold your hand out? Let's pray over Casey right now. Heavenly Father, Lord, I, I pray that uh, you would continue to work through Casey, uh, through the other volunteers in this ministry, Lord. Provide for them what they need. Most importantly, Father, give them the courage and the boldness to have those conversations like Casey had with this Nathan, Lord that more of them would come to know you as Lord and Savior, that you would bring healing, uh, not just to some of the knees, but to their souls, that you would mend the brokenness, Father. Do a mighty work through this ministry. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Casey. Let's thank you. Look, that is the message today, right? Be watching for those interruptions. Be seeking God always so that you recognize those interruptions. I have loved watching Casey. I got to meet with Jason a couple months ago and hear their testimony of where they were, where they are, and just their heart for Jesus. They are drawing close to God, and when we do that, we hear him speak. We sense those nudges. And we can recognize what the real needs are. It would be easy to go down there and just pass things out, but that real need is Jesus. And when you do that, when you do that, I promise you, when you listen and follow through on those nudges, God always shows up. You will get those same types of testimonies. Casey's testimony, as awesome as it is, is what God always does when we are faithful to what he has called us to do. And as we were singing the, the, the praise songs before the service, the one song was about listening to those lies we believe our believe about ourselves, and understanding that, uh, that that's not who God says we are. God says in our weakness, we are strong. You see, you may be sensing a nudge right now to do something. Maybe God is calling you into something, but all you can think is, I can't do that. I'm not equipped to do that. I'm not good enough to do that. It's not about you. If God is calling you to do it, he will equip you to do it. 
Casey's testimony that she did not feel like she could go through the streets and talk to these scary people. Now she's hugging them. That is God. That is the power of God. And because she was faithful, what is she doing? It's leaping up inside of her, gushing like water, the Holy Spirit within her. My friends, don't miss out on that reward from God for being faithful. Would you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, Lord, again, I thank you and praise you for this day. Lord, speak to us wherever we're at and reveal to us where it is you would have us go, what it is you would have us do. Lord, every single person sitting in, this, sitting in a pew today has a gift and a purpose. Reveal to each one of us what that is. And then, Father, help us to be faithful, to follow through with whatever it is you're calling us to do with the hope that you will not leave us alone in that, but that you will show up and that we will sense you in a mighty way. Help us, Father, to be faithful in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. My friends, this week, may God give you the wisdom to know the right, the courage to choose it, and the strength to endure. Amen.